Welcome back everyone, this is Shadow Drake. Today we're gonna go over cryo cooling. Why? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So, cryo cooling was really mostly a luxury thing for you to do. There really wasn't any need for you to cool things that cold unless you wanted to do something quirky like massive gas fuel generation, gas fuel generator power generation, or nitrogen for cooling you know as a coolant line um there really wasn't anything that you 100 percent needed it but recently though we've had updates where you could use liquid fuels for the liquid rocket engines and that requires liquid volatiles and liquid oxygen but even more recently with the with the update the cryo chambers are now the only things that can fully heal us so not only do they revive players but they're the also the only things that fully heal us uh the heal peel was nerfed to no longer fully heal us 100 percent so we do actually need a way to sustainably create some liquid nitrogen or buy it from a trader now the cryo chamber requires that you have liquid nitrogen colder than 150 Kelvin or basically colder than negative 123 Celsius. So basically that's what you need. So that kind of comes with the difficulty of making a cooling system. And if you're kind of new to this game and are not really fully 100% well versed in the little niches and uh things regarding the AC system or cooling in general, this is actually kind of a daunting challenge. So what I am going to show you is essentially two paths to get down that cold to make your liquid nitrogen or liquid volatiles and oxygen, whatever you desire. And there's two paths to go. You have the atmospheric AC path, which is chained ACs, or you have the phase change, which is basically phase change heat pumps that I have been showing. The, do the builds have to look exactly like this? The answer for, to that is no. All that matters is that you cool, get yourself cooled down to the appropriate temperature range. So let's take a look at what's happening. Let's start with the Atmospherics AC. Now, the Atmospherics AC, also with the recent update, changed in the little user interface on the screen panel. It shows the operational efficiency, temperature differential efficiency, pressure efficiency, and how much it's actually cooling, which is very helpful for you to diagnose and troubleshoot where you're having a bottleneck in the system. Love that change. So now, how does this work? Now, I have a huge tank here of CO2. It was 20 Celsius, but it's been heating up as both my systems have been working. Now, the AC... The biggest difficulty with this one is that as you get colder, the operational temp efficiency drops like a rock. And as you have a higher temperature differential between the input and the waste pipe, it once again also drops like a rock. So you'll see this one is cooling anywhere between 14 kilojoules and 8 kilojoules, and it just kind of jumps around. And that completely depends based on the systems back there. Now, by chained ACs, I mean the waste pipe on one AC is being actively cooled by another AC. Uh, for the first one, that's fairly simple. The 20 Celsius CO2 is going into the waste pipe, um, and then it is cooling some oxygen in this line. Does it have to be oxygen? No. It can be any gas. You just need uh, enough in there to be a pressure to keep it at a pressure above 111 kilopascals, because you need 111 kilopascals in both the input and the waste pipe to have 100% pressure efficiency. If you don't have 100% pressure ef efficiency, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Get it at 100% pressure efficiency. It's the easiest one of all of the three to fix and get correct. So the first AC is cooling down this oxygen down to, I put negative 30 Celsius to have a temperature differential of about 50 Celsius. So it's cooling it down to negative 30. And as you can tell here, this is feeding into the waste pipe of the next AC, which cools which cools its pipe down to negative 80 Celsius. And it basically keeps going down the line until you get to the final one. Now, technically I could have stopped at the negative 130 Celsius one, but I wanted to go a little bit further to the negative 170 Celsius because ideally you kind of want it a little bit colder. Anyways, when we look at the stats in the final one, you see that the operational temp efficiency is a whopping 12%. So we are losing a majority of a cooling because of that. There is no way around it. This will kill your performance. But you see the operation, the temperature differential efficiency is close to 100%. And that's honestly because it can't move energy as efficiently. 
and you see it's about negative 147 Celsius. And the reason for that is because what I'm doing with this pressure regulator is I'm pumping 20 Celsius nitrogen into this pipe. It's trickle feeding it, but it so it's warming it up a little bit, but then some of it is also condensing out. And that's one megapascals is basically where negative one for, where I expect it to stay at about negative 147. And when we look at this portable liquid tank, you see that I'm condensing about 200 joules. Uh, the latent energy of nitrogen is 500 joules. So basically I'm condensing about uh, two-fifths of a mole. So 0.4 moles of nitrogen is per tick is what's condensing out. And that's fine. You know, th this is to show a proof of concept. If you need if you need more condensing, faster rates, well, you can either pick a warmer temperature for that to happen or you just start expanding on the system. So how to expand the system to have greater cooling. Uh, you see that between the final AC is 1.58, 1.6, and this one is about 2.5. So what's happening is that this AC can cool a little bit more than this one. So if I add another AC in parallel with this one and do the same connections, input, output, and connected to that, waste pipe connected to that, then, you know, theoretically, I should have three kilojoules of cooling. So then this one now is no longer going to keep up. So I need another one here so that it can keep up with that load. And that'll take me to about five. This one will still keep up with that. So I don't need an extra one here. And this still keeps up with the one in front of it. So I don't need an extra one. So you see, I can add an extra AC here and an extra AC there. And I basically doubled the cooling if it, the cooling amount on this end to hopefully be cooling, <laughs> condensing close to a mole of nitrogen per tick. Now, if I really wanted to keep up with roughly 8 or 14 kilojoules on the top end, well, then, uh, yeah, uh, about 8 to 14 kilojoules, you know, uh, that's what, 8 AC. So, you know, 8 AC is that way. Uh, this one's 2.44, so maybe 7 AC, 6 to 7 AC is that way. This one might need another one just because it's at 7 to keep up with the one. And you'll see that basically that's a lot of ACs just to increase on this cooling speed. And it's up to you to decide if that's worth it or not. Honestly, probably will be worth it. But now, the power for this is 350 watts per AC. So you see I have four ACs, 350 watts. Uh, that puts me at roughly, what, 1,400 watts of energy just to cool this down. And I am only getting about that much in cooling. So I am actually at wall cooler wall cooler levels of power efficiency almost a one-to-one -one, just with this setup and this is the difficulty with cryo cooling it's just absolutely hard to cool things down and it's and you see the same issues on venus except for venus you're kind of cooling down to 20 celsius but on the hot end is what's you know killing your power efficiency because the top end is like what 30 percent effective and yeah you'll have like the 14 kilojoules and you need to have 14 kilojoules on the hot end and Venus. So it, it's the same concept. You're spending quite a bit of power to move energy. All right, so then this is kind of where phase change comes in because it is much more power efficient, but is the rate comparable? So when I originally made phase change videos, I didn't really want to give this solution just because I, again, cryo cooling was not really needed. It was kind of a niche concept. If you wanted to get down far that far, I was hoping that that would be something you could use as a, as a learning opportunity for how to get that cold. But since we need some cryo cooling, let's, you know, let's cover that. So again, working with 20 Celsius, and I chose 20 Celsius because you're going to be cooling or heating yourself up to 20 Celsius. It's a stable temperature source because you need that to you know live as well as for your plants and chickens should you choose to have some so when we get down to that point from 20 celsius down to what negative 170 celsius we have kind of a problem nothing a single refrigerant cannot take you there refrigerator blah, blah, pollutants can take you from 20 celsius to about negative 100 celsius okay so that's cool but now what's the other three choices well oxygen does not does not intersect with the pollutant phase change graph. So you can see the compared to oxygen, you see that uh, 
Before oxygen begins condensing, pollutants have already frozen over and broken your pipes. Yay. When we take a look at nitrogen, you see, oh, hey, nitrogen can work. But the problem with nitrogen is it begins condensing at about negative 83 Celsius. The, the graph doesn't quite highlight this. And so between negative 100 to negative 83 Celsius, that's about, what, a 17 Celsius temperature range. It's a very narrow band, but it will allow nitrogen to begin condensing. Volatiles will begin condensing about negative 72. So negative 72 to negative 100 Celsius, that's 28 Celsius band of, you know, of the two intersecting. But as you can tell, volatiles is not as wide as nitrogen, and that's, that's fine. But it does give us a better uh, intersection between the two. And I'm going to use that for this example. And the only reason for that is because when your refrigerant is phase changing, it struggles hard at the hottest end and at the coldest end. So pollutants will have a hard time condensing nitrogen. It'll still do it, but it'll have a harder time compared to volatiles. And in the same point, volatiles will have an easier time dumping energy to the pollutants compared to nitrogen. So that's what I'm going to use. We're going to have two phase change heat pumps, pollutants and volatiles. And then the volatiles will try to take us down to negative 170. And that's, you know, negative 192. Now, the other reason is volatiles has a latent energy of one kilojoules per mole. Nitrogen has a latent energy of 500 joules per mole. So I do roughly double the latent energy, bigger intersection with pollutants. And I expect that to translate to even better energy movements. All right. So that's the two, that's the two refrigerants. And this is my pollutants. And this is my volatiles right there. I should have colored them. Uh, but I don't know. I, I, I personally don't see paints. Now, for both of them, the condensation chamber is set to 6,000 6, uh, kPa, or 6 megapascals. And that's because when I did the phase change heat pump tutorial, literally next door to this setup, uh, setting the condensation chamber to 6 megapascals is maximum heating. And on the opposite end, setting the evaporation chamber to literally zero is maximum cooling. And so now we see that base, you know, this is what's that what's moving. So I have my pollutants and it's not super filled because again, other stuff and my evaporation chamber, which is evaporating and it's got 19.4 liters of liquids. Uh, again, you also have a counterflow. So that's ba that's the basic phase change heat pump. Condensation chamber, evaporation chamber, uh, counterflow, piping and ignore the uh, the liquid drain and the purge valve. Uh, the only reason I needed those is because I wanted to fill pressurize the liquid pipe network for the pollutants with oxygen because they will not condense. And the pressure here will prevent the pollutants from evaporating or condensing and having some parasitic phase change loss to affect the system. It's not 100% required, but it's something that you can use to improve the system. And I wanted to see what it will work when it's fully improved. Uh, and that's what the drain was for, to help me drain out liquid pollutants when this got fuller than 20 liters. And the purge valve was to empty out some of the oxygen as I reintroduced more and more oxygen to force the pollutants to condense, And but the pipe network got more pressurized. So that's what that's for. So you can see we're going to 21 Celsius, and here it gets us cold to about negative 93 Celsius. Take a note of that latent energy, 7.73, 7.73. It's a perfectly balanced system. And, but when you look at the heat exchange rate, you see that I'm only moving 1.72 kilojoules of energy. Uh, so you can see that most of my latent energy is spent cooling the pollutants itself and not as much for moving energy from the cold end. Now, between the volatiles and the, and the pollutant phase change heat pumps, I just basically have some oxygen. That's basically the intermediary. It gets cooled by the pollutants and it gets heated up by the volatiles. And the only reason, again, I'm using oxygen is it does not condense at this temperature range. It is safe for me to use as a pressure here, as a coolant that bridges the two. And then we have the, uh, the volatiles. Same thing, maximum capacity, 3.46 kilojoules. Maximum evaporation, 3.46 kilojoules. You see 13 liters, somewhere between 5 and 15 liters. Not maxed out at 20 liters. So, yeah. And as far as energy movement goes, you see 1.7 kilojoules. Again, also 
1.72 kilojoules. So probably a little bit of loss here, and that's probably from the nitrogen being pumped in. So what what am I seeing as far as condensation goes? Uh, 110 joules. This actually confuses me a little bit, and I'm wondering if this is part of the whole atmospheric simulation. Like maybe this this the 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 order of operations is different from that one. I expected it to be about the same because I don't see it potentially being affected, but it actually could be that maybe that is moving more. Either way, I am condensing liquid nitrogen. Strangely enough, it seems to be about half the rate as compared to the ACs. Despite the fact that the AC says that it's moving less energy compared to the phase change heat pump. Uh, probably some shenanigans going afoot. All right, but... What about power? Well, remember that I said that phase change is an extremely power efficient system? Well, those four, 200 watts of power, and I'm moving 1.7 kilojoules of energy. So yeah, that's roughly eight, a COP of eight. So that's already highly efficient. Very little power, very little power is being used compared to the AC system, and it's doing roughly the same amount of work. And just like the AC system, if I want to increase the cooling speed, I can just essentially make parallel setups. I can take, I can copy and paste this setup, and by copy and paste, I mean you build it by hand, and just basically build out that way. Same thing as the ACs, build out that way. It's only going to cost 100 watts per two systems. And if the pollutants is no longer keeping up with that, same thing, copy and paste that way. Again, very power efficient, moving a lot more energy for power use, and it's still making liquid nitrogen. So where does this go from here? But once you have your liquid nitrogen at like the negative 130 Celsius or colder, well then now you can actually make your cryo chamber work. When I turn this cryo chamber on, it now says, my breathing atmosphere is unsafe, why? Oh, well, probably because it's Mars, that's fine. Uh, but it says that it will regenerate disease patients, it will heal damaged patients. And that's because the liquid nitrogen is below 150 Kelvin. And you can see that in the in the tooltip, I hope. I hope you can see it on the tooltip. Oh, I can't move my mouse. That it is 126 Kelvin. So, yay. Oops, sorry. Now, if you want to actually get stuff colder, this is about the point where I would recommend using phase change because the ACs are just going to not cut it. Like if for some reason you decide to you decide to be funny and litter somebody's bases with a bunch of pink ice rocks of volatiles, you see that it freezes at negative 192 Celsius. Um, nitrogen can phase change and be colder than volatiles, so you can use nitrogen to phase change and of uh, some volatiles to actually freeze it. I don't know why you want to do this, but you probably would do like a phase change heat pump system or something else to do that. And so, yeah, that's all that I got. Just remember, ACs, simple to set up, power expensive, but it will get you there quicker. Uh, phase change heat pump, uh, again, technically simple setup, but it requires a little bit more intuitive knowledge on the phase change diagram to get it working. And by that mean, how much to fill it, how much to, what considerations you should have. But again, it is extremely power efficient. Both systems can be expanded on. You can parallel them up, parallel them together to increase the amount of energy moving. And again, it just depends on how much you want to, how much energy you want to move or how much not liquids you want to create. And that's up to you entirely. All right. That covers cryocooling. I hope this is a good help and setup for anyone who wants to make their own liquid nitrogen or liquid rocket fuels. Uh, again, th that was nitrogen at the very end right there. So that's what I would recommend just so that you actually have access to your cryo chamber. So thank you for your time. I hope this helps and I hope to see you later. Thank you and have a good day. Bye bye.